uh, Gertie, did you reserve a conference room at the jail for Mr. Mason? Oh, good. Okay, Chief, you've got a conference room. So just sign these letters and you can be on your way. All right. What time is it, Della? It's almost noon. Oh, we'll have to get moving. We? Yes, don't you want to go? Well, not particularly. Visiting a jail is not my idea of a gay afternoon. Well, mine either, but if Francis Riley talks, I want you to take notes. So get your coat and your notebook, please. Yes, sir. Oh, now, now, don't take it so hard, Della. I'll buy you a very good lunch before we go. Mm. Now, is that better? Mm. Blake's? All right, Blake's it is. <laughs> oh, don't what, you've got something? Yes, phone call. Uh, get your coat. All right, I'll get yours, too. All right. Uh, Gertie, get the Beekman home for me, please. Want your overcoat, Chief? No, you... uh, top coat will be all right today. I think it's warm enough. Uh-huh. I don't need a heavy coat. Oh, Audrey, uh, it's Perry Mason. Mm-hmm. How was Kate's audition? Or is it too soon today? What? The doctor see her? And... Well, I don't have to tell you how sorry I am. Yeah. All right, we'll stop by later in the day, if you think. No, no, no trouble. Yes, yes, of course. And, Audrey, if there's anything I can do... We... Mm-hmm. All right, goodbye. Here you are. Here's your coat, Chief. Well, come on, Perry. I'm going to take time to eat a good lunch. Perry? What is it? Kate did find at her audition up until the time she collapsed... Collapsed? Mm. From what? I don't know. I suppose it's the result of that automobile crash. Dr. Hill warned her to watch it. Well, is it serious? It's not dangerous. But it's very serious. Kate's not to do any more dancing. You mean not for a while? Not for a long while. Maybe never. Oh, Perry. Does Kate know? Yes, yes. Well, she's been afraid all along. She didn't say anything because she wouldn't even admit it to herself. And that's why... That's why what? Why Kate acted as, as she has ever since the accident. She's been afraid. She kept it to herself all these weeks. She home now? Let's go by, Perry, just to let her know we're thinking of her. And fighting all by herself. Can't we go by? There's time. Well, there's time before we see Francis Riley, but we won't have time for lunch. Well, I lost my appetite. Yeah. Okay. I'll have the garage send around the car. <laughs> But meanwhile, the fastidiously tailored fat man called J.T. is not doing without lunch. In fact, his midday meal is served on a special table in his office. But now, just as J.T. lifts the silver-covered dish from a steaming soup tureen... Uh, well, what is it? Tell him to wait. Uh. Now, really? Yes? Oh, indeed. Well, tell him I said... Uh, no, no, no. Send him in. Send him in now. Yes. Thanks for not making me cool my heels. That's quite all right, Gordy. If yeah. you don't mind talking while I eat a bite of lunch. Well, or... I, I, I gotta beat it. You pressed for time? Oh, I'm busy as a flea on a hot stove. I got crews of carpenters and painters out at the club, and I want to supervise everything myself. I'm supposed to open next week. So you are. However... Yeah, which reminds me. We got a real break. You know the girl I got to play the piano, Tony Fasina? Well, Tony used to go with the guy who writes the entertainment column in a record. He's going to give us a real send-off. It's uh, good soup, huh? Delicious. Yeah, you don't have to tell me. You didn't miss a bite when I told you about the publicity. What'd you expect, a pat on the back for doing a job? Okay, okay, I get it. I'm just a cog in a big organization, but you're not so big either. Cody. Well, you're big compared with me. I mean, you're, you're, you're little compared with the big fella. Uh, and if I hurt your feelings, I apologize. My feelings aren't that easily hurt. Well? Uh, well, the club's going okay. It'll make an ideal front. Yes, What's the matter, J.T.? Ain't it all right for me to even talk about it with you? When I bring the matter up... But you... And now I'm bringing the matter up. Remember, it's a matter of detail, Gordy. Detail. Take care of the little things, and the big things will take care of themselves. Uh, you remember my giving you the analogy of the vice president of a bank who said a certain debtor would come in and pay, uh, if I remember correctly, $13.13 at a certain time? Sure. And that the vice president wanted that debtor to bring in the stated amount at the stated time because if he didn't, 
He would lose face? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, a detail. But a detail which makes or breaks an organization, be it a bank or an organization like ours. Our organization stands or falls on details. Yeah, I, I quote the big fella. Well, why do you tell me all this, J.T.? The club's coming fine. The rest is coming fine. I'm paying attention to details. And speaking of details, J.T., I got a million of them to take care of. Look, if, if the reason you got me here was to read me a lecture on details, I have my lecture. And now, if you don't mind, maybe I'd better get on to something important, like going... Gordy, on... nothing is more important than this discussion. What do you mean? Look, J.T., what's this all about? Details, like Kate Beekman... What about her? That was my question. Oh, now, look, look, J.T., if you're going to blame me for... <laughs> What's the idea? You're throwing ice water at me. What's your idea of talking to me like that? Huh? Who do you think you are, Gordy? I asked a question. No, no answer. Very well, perhaps you'd prefer me to answer for you. You're a little man, a shrimp... A five-foot-two man with a desire to appear six feet tall. J.T.? Yes? You're gonna... What? Are you threatening me, Gordy? Well, I... Could I have a napkin to wipe the water off? When I finish what I was saying. That I'm little. Exactly. And because you're little, you want to impress. You want to talk big, be looked on as big. But you don't deliver... And to be big, you've got to be dependable. You have to deliver, and on time. Yeah, well, if you're cooled off, you may use a napkin. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, J.T. Yeah. Uh, look, wait, will you tell me where I fell down? I'm referring to Kate Beekman. Well, look, look, uh, if, if you're worrying about that dance director... You promised she'd work in the club... Well, she's going to get the job. Oh, you little man with a little brain. She can't. Huh? She's incapacitated. She was injured in an accident. She isn't strong enough to dance night after night. Huh? A detail you should have known about. What? I... Well, maybe I'll have to get someone else then. Gordy. Well, there's nothing else to do. Oh, yes, there is. What? Gus would think of something. Gus? Yes, Gus. Gus doesn't have a Napoleon complex. J.T., you saying that I... Got I'm a... saying we need someone who can think to run that nightclub. Well, I thought Gus was going to handle the other end, the cars. Maybe I can train Junior. Junior? For my place, J.T., what is this? What's wrong? Miss Beekman can't dance. And I want her working in the club. But why? Uh, I don't think I need give you a reason. You... Oh, well, no, no, of course not, but, uh... But what? Well, I'll, I'll get her. How? Well, I don't know, right off. How? I... Well, I don't know. Gordy, I've given you your last chance. I'm going to tell the big fella. All this over nothing! Over detail, the detail on which our organization is built. For your information, Kate Beekman working at the club is a detail, a necessary detail, which you didn't have the wit to see. You've had your last chance. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm busy. I... What? Well, can't Gus take care of it? You... Well, then get hold of him. You go to him. Yeah, yeah, Jesse. Where's Gus? Well, it's not due back at town tomorrow, but uh, listen, Shut I... Shut up. Gus isn't here. I'll try to arrange something. Hey. Yes, Gordy's here, but he won't be long. I'll explain later, sir. Listen, Jake, the Gus has been working under me. I know all his boys, his contacts. If it's trouble, I can help. Look, give me a chance, J.T., will you? Give me a chance. J.T.? Even if I did, there'd still be the other problem. Well, I'm, I'm working out an angle on that, too. Yes, I can believe it. I'll give you this, Gordy. You keep thinking even when you're backed into a corner. All right. Think about this. One of Gus's boys is in jail. Well, that happens all the time. I know. I also know Gus is careful to cover his tracks. But this is different. Riley, oh, the boy's name is Riley, probably knows only a few details. Uh, details again. Details again. And Mr. Perry Mason again. Huh? Mr. Mason is going to see Riley this afternoon. Mason. Mason interviewed Riley once. Now he will see him again. Well, Mason's a big-time lawyer. Why should he get involved? 
Perhaps for the same reason he's interested in the Beekmans. Perhaps, oh, possibly a thousand reasons. The fact remains he will see Riley, and even though Riley doesn't have pertinent information, uh, Mr. Perry Mason is a keen man. Wait a minute. Huh? Think of something? Yeah, yeah, we got a little time? A little. Let me use the phone. For what? Listen to what I say, J.P., but I gotta hurry. No tricks, Gordy. No, 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 listen, J.P., I guarantee it. Mason's not gonna get one single thing out of Riley. That's a promise. Uh... And I'll tell you something else. I can work out the angle on Beekman with a little help. Tell me later. Yes, yeah, sure. I just want you to know I can work out the angle. Hello, Junior. Gordy. Yeah, listen. What time's your brother-in-law go on duty? Well, good. Get on this fast, Junior. Well, what do you think the angle is that Gordy has figured in reference to the boy Perry Mason is going to see? And why, so obviously, does a man like J.T. want Kate Beekman and his organization? And just what kind of a man is J.T.? Well, be sure to join us on Monday, won't you? It's 30 minutes after 12 noon as Ed Beekman starts to knock on the closed door of Kate's room. It's 30 minutes after 12 noon as Ed Beekman starts to knock on the closed door of Kate's room. Huh? Oh, Mr. Mason, the street. Hello, Ed. Hello, Ed. Hello, come on in. Ward's down at the drugstore. You, you know what happened to Kate? Yes. We stopped by to speak to her. If you think... Well, I, I don't know. I just got here. Do you mind waiting while I see how she's feeling? No, no, you go right ahead. Yes, Ma. It's me, baby. Oh, come in, Pa. Hello, Kate. Pa. Oh, I'll move the newspaper so you can no, sit down. Never mind. I'll, I'll do it. Aren't you working, Pa? Well, Miss Powers phoned from the warehouse. I, I got off. I... Oh. Uh, can Nicholas Importing Company get along without the assistant form? Oh, they'll struggle along for a while. How are you feeling, baby? Well, I feel just fine. The back hurt? No. You say Miss Powers phoned you? Yeah. Isn't she a wonderful person? Oh, I guess. I, I only talked to her for a minute. She she said nice things about you, Katie. Did she? She says you've got more talent than any young dancer she's seen in a long time. She says... Don't well, tell me. Huh? I don't want to hear. Well, Kate, I... Because it doesn't mean anything anymore. I can't dance anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. Time your old man opens his mouth and puts his foot in. Oh, it's all right, Pa. You're only trying to help. Katie, I'm more sorry than I can oh, say. Don't be. There, there's nothing for you to be sorry about. The doctor says I can lead a normal life and hope... What about dancing, kid? He said I'm to forget about it. So I... I'm going to forget about it. As soon as I get used to it. Yeah, sure, baby. Sure. It isn't easy to forget something you, you've you always thought about, but but I'm going to try. Try as hard as I can. I'm proud of you, Katie. Don't... Don't you have to go back to the w warehouse, Pa? When your ma comes back. She gone? The drugstore for some medicine. Oh. Uh, Mr. Mr. Why Mason... Why didn't she let me go? Huh? Well, I'm able to walk to the corner and back. I, I'm not an invalid, even if I'm not able to... Oh, Pa, I can't stand it if you and Ma treat me like I'm sick. I'm not sick. Just because my back hurt and I, I can't dance, that, that doesn't mean I can't do anything else. Yeah, of course not. I'm going to forget about dancing. I'm going to find another job. That, that's what I started to do a minute ago. I've got the paper and I'm going to look at the classified ad section. This time, No, baby, I... I'm going to do it right away. Give me that part of the paper, Pa. The column under Help Wanted Female. See, there are always dozens and dozens of jobs listed under Help Wanted Female. But there... Run any dancing jobs listed under help wanted. See, there won't be anything to remind me of dancing. So I, I won't even have to think about. Oh, Pop. Oh, you poor kid. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to cry. And I, I don't want anybody to see me cry. Maybe is there anything I can do? <laughs> No. Katie, if there's anything... I know, I, I know you would. 
We love you, baby. Pa, I love you. But there's nothing you can do to help. I, I've got to forget it. And nobody can help me forget it. I, I've got to do it by myself. Yeah. You, you want to talk some more? I... No. Not now. I'll be here till Mother comes back. Call if you want me, huh? Oh. How is she, Ed? Well, her back don't hurt. Only when she tries to dance. She's got to forget about dance. That hurts. Della, suppose we postpone talking to Kate. Hmm? We can stop by later or in a day or so. Yes, of course, Chief. Ed. Huh? Yeah, Mr. Mason. Look, if there's anything I can do, another doctor or treatment, sir, well, you let me know. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Mason. And we'll keep in touch. All right, Della, last one. Oh, dear. Yeah, it's tough. Here, I'll get the door. All right. The car's down this way. Perry, mm. don't you think there's a chance that Kate will dance again? I don't know. You have your notebook, Della? What? Yes, I've got it. You changing the subject, Counselor? Yes. There's nothing we can do for Kate now. Later, we'll see. Meanwhile, worrying won't help her. Are you sure you have your notebook? Yes. I don't know why I bothered. Well, what does that mean? Well, Francis Riley didn't talk the first time you saw him. So I'll try it again. Maybe he hasn't got anything to say. Do you ever think of that? Now that you ask me, yes, I have. Oh? This long lawyer who took Riley's case is inexperienced. Yet he seems to be a bright young man. And quite nice looking. Mm -hmm. Well, the young lawyer feels that Riley is a nice kid. Now, you take me. I talk to Riley, and I think that he's a nice kid. Both of us could be wrong, but if we aren't, then a very nice kid has got himself mixed up in some very bad trouble. And that means there's a story. I mean to learn what it is. Well, as you know, Gordy Weber and J.T., Gordy's boss, are very much concerned with what Perry Mason is going to do because they're concerned about both Kate Beekman and Francis Riley. And at this moment, in J.T.'s office... Time's almost up, Gordy. Mr. Perry Mason's appointment to see Francis Riley is in just, uh, uh, 28 minutes. Yeah, 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 I know, but I've taken care of it, J.T., you'll see. Now just leave everything to me. I'm like a flea. I can jump around. I can move fast. While I can... Oh, now, don't get me wrong. I wasn't making cracks because you're fat. So I'm a shrimp and you're fat. So what? It's not a guy's size or what he looks like that counts. It's how he comes through in a squeeze. And how are you going to come through? Just wait, will you? Wait till that phone rings. I'm waiting. All your worries will be over. I'll wait. They will be, J.T. They will be. How about Kate Beekman? You'll have a J.T. on a silver platter if that's the way you want it. Although I don't... Yeah, that's it. I'll find out. Yes. Speaking. Yes, put him on. Gordy's here. For you. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hello, Junior. Yeah, I've been waiting. You got the message through? Yeah, make sure, Junior. Yeah. Yeah, good work, Junior. Well, it's all fixed, J.T. Kid won't say a word to Mason. Well, ain't that what you want? If that's the way it is, promises are cheap. I tell you, it's all fixed up. Now, look, J.T., can I say something? I pulled a boner. I was wrong, and I admit it. I made a mistake. But you're wrong about one thing. It ain't one of these one-strike-and-you're-out deals. Go on, Gordy. I got an angle. Yeah, so you say. No, no, I mean it. I didn't understand. But I can deliver Kate Beekman. Just leave it up to me. No. I think you will, J.T. And I'll tell you why. Because you're on the spot, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you lost your temper and bounced me around a little while ago. I didn't realize getting that girl was so important, but I do now. And I know how to get her, so that makes me important, too. And if I can do it, that should mean something to you. It should mean we're right back where we started. I'm still running the club. If I can. But I'm not going to tell you how, unless you tell me. 
Then I'm on top of the heap again. In other words, uh, deal, huh? Yeah, yeah. How about it? Is it a deal, J.T.? <laughs> the reason I put up with you, Gordy, is that I, I, I love to see you squirm around. <laughs> I admire the way you do it so fast. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right, then we made a deal, huh? Uh, deal. Well, I suppose, since that would be the rational thing to do, of course I'll deal... After I agree you know how to handle Kate Beekman. Well, in addition to her heavy sorrow and unknown to her, there's a reason why Kate Beekman is essential to J.T.'s operation. A reason which could mean mortal danger for Kate herself. By all means, here tomorrow's important and exciting developments. It's early afternoon. Shortly after the close of our last episode, as inside city jail, a guard leads prisoner Francis Riley towards a conference room. Come on, step it up, Riley, step it up. Eh, quit dragging your feet, kid. Wait a minute, Mr. Noel. For what? You're doing the conference room now. <coughs> you keep the gent waiting. I don't want to see Mr. Mason. What? How do you know it's Mr. Mason? The Sarge told me he made the appointment out of a clear blue sky and, and only a little while ago. And how'd you know it's Mason? I don't know. I must have heard it somewhere. Ah, grapevines in good working order. Okay. Here we are. Look, Mr. Nolan, I, I don't feel good. I'm sick. Huh? I don't want to see Mr. Mason. I don't have to if I'm sick, do I? No. Not if you're sick. No kidding, Mr. Nolan. I, I don't feel good. You don't look good. You look scared to death. What's eating you, kid? Why are you scared of Perry Mason? I'm not. All right, then. Quit acting like it. All right, go ahead. Oh, hi, Mr. Mason. Mr. Street. Nolan. Hello, Francis. Hello, Mr. Mason. Uh, I'll be out in the hall. Just punch the buzzer when you want me. How are you doing, Mr. Street? Fine, Nolan. You? Uh, well, to tell you the truth, me feet hurt. <laughs> I'm sorry. Francis, this is my secretary, Miss Street. How do you do? Um, won't you sit down? No, thanks, Mr. Mason. Look, Mr. Mason, I got nothing to say, so you can punch that buzzer now. Oh, I just got here. So now you can just wheel around and get out of here. Yes, yes, I could. Well, then do it. Leave me alone. Why don't you just leave me alone? I'm sorry, Mr. Mason. I shouldn't have said that. I know you want to help. Yes. But you can't. There's nothing you or anybody else can do. Well, why don't you sit down? You feeling well, Francis? Yeah. No. I mean, I'm okay. Look, quit wasting your time, Mr. Mason. Oh, nothing I'd rather do than waste time. See, if I weren't here, I'd be in my office where Miss Street would make me go to work. Miss Street here keeps my nose to the grindstone. Don't you believe it, Francis. I just try to. Oh. Give me a match, Chief. Yeah. Would you like a cigarette, Francis? No, ma'am, I don't smoke. I wasn't kidding, Mr. Mason. There's nothing I can tell you. Well, perhaps you'll change your mind after I tell you a couple of things. Will you listen? Yes, sir, but... Yes, sir? You're in a tough spot, Francis. You stole a car, you were drinking, you wrecked the car, and you're lucky somebody didn't get killed. Okay, those things are facts. When you go to trial, you'll be found guilty. And that's all she wrote. No, that isn't the whole story. Your judge will have a choice to make. He can give you a light sentence, or he can throw the book at you. He'll make up his mind according to the facts he knows about you. Now, some people have talked to me about you, Francis. Gertie Lang, my office girl. She's known you since you were a kid. Gertie says you're the last boy she expected to see get in trouble. And Gertie has sense. Your lawyer spoke to me. Mr. Pratt's a nice guy. Yes. He and I agree that there's more to it than the known facts. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, snap out of it, Riley. You didn't start drinking on impulse. You didn't steal that car on impulse. Something or somebody made you jump the track. What really happened, Francis? Nothing. I mean, look, nobody made me do it. I, I did it on my own hook. Oh? You ever had a drink before the night you stole that car? Sure, lots of times. What? Well, well, I get a bottle. What brand? Well, different kinds. Well, name a few. Well, I don't remember. Oh. Why did you decide to steal a car? I just did. Why? Well... I wanted money. Did you expect to sell it? Sure. Where? Where? Yes, that's what I asked. Where do you sell a stolen car? I'm curious. Where? 
I hadn't worked that out yet. You must have had an idea. Well... You wouldn't steal a car without having some idea where to dispose of it. No, sir. Okay, where? Well, what, what I mean is I had kind of an idea. Where? Well, I really didn't know a place. You stole a car without knowing where to sell it? Yes, sir. No. You got, you got me all mixed up. Huh. It was so easy to get you all mixed up, Francis. When a man starts lying, he trips over his own lies. Why don't you tell me the truth? I can't. Afraid of the consequences? No, you're putting words in my mouth, Mr. Mason. I didn't say I'm scared. What have I got to be scared about? Now, where'd you get that crazy idea, Mr. Mason? Look, if I said one single word gave you the idea I'm scared or anything... Well, I'm not going to say any more, Mr. Mason. Not another word. Well, keep that up. And the judge is going to throw the book at you, Francis. I guess I can take it. Hmm, sure. Of course, it'll be hard for your mother to take. Mom? You talk to Mom? She came to see me. How is Mom? You should know. Yeah. Well, at least I'm not dead. What made you say that? I just said it. Why? Because there are worse things than what will happen to me. Now, go ahead. Punch the button, Mr. Mason. No, wait a minute. Before you go, I... I want to tell you and Miss Street both that I... I... I hate to be a jerk, Mr. Mason. You taking the trouble to help me. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I mean it. You know I mean it. Yes, I think you do. If I could tell you anything... I just can't. I, I want to ask you one more favor, Mr. Mason. Tell her I'll be okay. Tell her not to worry. Just tell her not to worry. Sure. Thanks. Now, go ahead. Call the guy. Now, sometime later, as in the office of Gordy Weber's immediate superior... Uh, send Mr. Weber in. Okay, J.T.? I believe so, Gordy. Uh -huh. Apparently the boy followed instructions. Apparently he gave Mr. Perry Mason no information. Well, not that he really knew anything. Gus is real careful that way. Yes, but Perry Mason is a keen individual. Ah, J.T., look, even if the kid told Mason everything he knows... Mason could become interested... Gordy, let me tell you something. You've no idea of the scope and size of our enterprise. Well, I know it's big. Very big. But we're very careful to make it look small. Very small. Yeah, I understand, J.T., but I still say Riley couldn't spill the beans because he don't know enough. Uh, perhaps you're right. That isn't true of Kate Beekman. Uh, you ready for me to go ahead? I can get it done today, tomorrow at the latest. You think it'll work, Gordy? Yeah, I know the girl. You want me to go ahead? I've been thinking about it, Gordy. Well, what's there to think about? We want the girl where we can keep tabs on her. I know the way to handle it. Look, I'm just wasting time, J.T. I'll get busy. Come back here. Huh? You aren't going to do it, Gordy. There's a better way. Oh, yeah? You think so, huh? I'm telling you, J.T., I know that girl, and I know what she'll fall for. Oh, we'll use your idea, my boy, but uh, we'll ask someone else to put it into effect. Who? You don't need to know that, Gordy. Yeah, well, maybe I get it. The big fella? What do you mean? Well, you got to clear with the big fella. Oh, of course, I'll discuss it with him. Yeah, meaning you got to ask his permission. What's it uh, like, J.T.? What? Working for the guy. You work for him, too. Uh -uh, I work for you. Yeah, but actually... Uh -uh, uh -uh. I never saw the guy. I don't even know his name. Uh -huh. What's he like, J.T.? I shouldn't be curious if I were you, Gordy. Well, how can I help but be curious? Look, what kind of a guy is the big fella? He's a brilliant man, Gordy. Yeah. Extremely able. And hard as nails, huh? When necessary, but he strikes one as being a handsome, cultivated gentleman. Good looking? Oh, very handsome, athletic figure. <laughs> <Yeah. Huh? laughs> Everything you're not, huh, J.T.? Why, uh... I... yes, Gordy. Everything I'm not. Although it isn't very tactful of you to say so. Well, no offense, J.T. Tell the big guy hello for me, huh? Very well, Gordy. I'm going to see him shortly. Yes, yes, I'll tell him. 
Hey, now I think you'd better get out. I'll contact you later in the day. Well, aren't you curious about the handsome and cultured and mysterious man J.T. calls the big fellow? We're going to meet the big fellow in our next episode. So be sure to join us tomorrow, won't you? The offices of Consolidated Motor Sales Corporation are big. The handsome furnishings display excellent taste and are of excellent quality, as if to announce that Consolidated Motor Sales is a big, successful company. The office of the president, naturally, is also big, also beautifully decorated. And Herbert G. Selby Esquire, the president, is just such a man as you'd expect to head a big, successful business. For you'd be struck at once by Mr. Herbert G. Selby's vigorous and powerful personality, by his very handsome presence, by his cultured accents. Mr. Herbert G. Selby is a big fellow. In fact, Mr. Herbert G. Selby is the big fellow. But that, of course, is a closely guarded secret. Certainly the pretty secretary standing beside Mr. Selby, admiring his profile, doesn't know his real identity. But even if she did, maybe she wouldn't care. Mr. Selby is a most handsome gentleman. And thoughtful, too. He gives his secretary a long moment in which to admire him. And then... <clears throat> Very well, Miss Fallon, you may take these letters. Yes, sir. Oh, I'll be out of the office the balance of this week. Oh, you're going out of town, Mr. Selby? To my country place, get in a bit of skiing. Oh. Have to keep fit, you know. No excuse for a chap to let himself go to pot. I shall return on Monday. Well, if you're leaving now, I'll get the purchase orders for you to sign. Uh, never mind, Miss Fallon. Well, I... if you please, sir, the vice president located 30 units in the medium price range. One and two-year-old models. I have the purchase order ready. The vice president will sign it. Give it to Mr. Doherty, and hereafter, Mr. Doherty will sign all purchase orders. Yes, sir. That puzzle you, Miss Fallon? Well, no, sir. Only... Perfectly natural, perfectly sound procedure. I'm going to let J.T. take some of the responsibility. Yes, sir. Huh? <laughs> I couldn't help thinking. You know what you said about keeping fit? We had to order Mr. Doherty another swivel chair. Oh. Yes. He's worn out three swivel chairs this year. Do you know what the girls in accounting call him, Mr. Selby? No. What? Well, no, perhaps I shouldn't tell you. Go on, my dear. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> 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 oh, well, J.T., I didn't expect you back so early. Yeah, apparently, I returned in time to hear a very funny joke. A joke? Why, yes. I heard you and this Fallon laughing. Uh, won't you tell me the joke, Mr. Selby? <laughs> I, I love a joke. All fat men love jokes. Uh, you tell me, Miss Fallon. <laughs> well, I, I, I forgot what it was. Uh, that's oh. all, Miss Fallon. You... Want to see me, J.T.? Uh, yes, sir, if you've a moment. I was on the point of leaving. Can it wait? I deeply appreciate your giving me a moment now, sir, if you'd be so kind. Oh, very well. Yes, Miss Fallon. Well, I was going to ask Mr. Dowdy, uh, shall I put the purchase orders on your desk, Mr. Dowdy? No, send them through channels to the business office as usual, as soon as they're signed, of course. Well, you haven't signed them yet, Mr. Dowdy. Of course not. I don't sign them. Yes, but Mr. Selby... Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Selby. I, I thought you'd told Mr. Dowdy. I think it's a good idea for you to sign them, J.T. Only natural for the vice president to share the responsibility and authority. You've certainly earned the privilege, J.T. I'm overwhelmed, sir. Isn't that a handsome gesture, Miss Fallon? <laughs> but I mustn't let your generosity overcome your good judgment, Mr. Selby. I beg pardon? Oh, you can leave, Miss Fallon. Yes, sir. If you please, I'd like Miss Fallon to hear this and remember it. Will you always remember what I'm about to say, Miss Fallon? Why, yes, sir. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> because I'm sure you agree with me that Mr. Selby is a remarkable man. Uh, don't you agree? Oh, why, yes, yes, I do. And certainly you agree that Mr. Selby is the heart and soul of Consolidated Motors. Uh, Mr. Selby originates all policies. He bears full responsibility, uh, full responsibility for our operations. And uh, though it's kind of him to suggest that I share his responsibilities, Mr. Selby's business genius is so complex... Uh, did you know that uh, there are many things about this business I don't know? <laughs> Mr. Selby keeps me very much in the dark about me, many of his transactions. <laughs> oh, not that I'm complaining, sir, and thank you, thank you just the same, but uh, uh, Mr. Selby will sign the orders, miss. Yes. All right, I'll do it on my way out. Yes, sir. 
I backed. Now, just a moment, J.T. I really did think... I backed. Or would you prefer having me call you Big Fella? <laughs> oh, you're a fool, Herbert. <laughs> well, we'll discuss that later. First, there's uh, something for you to do. I want you to see Helen Powers. What? I'll explain so that even you can understand. Your friend, Miss Powers, auditioned a young lady at her dance studio this morning. The young lady's name is Kate Beekman. I want Miss Beekman to work for Gordon Weber. You follow me? I'm not stupid, J.T. What about the girl? It's uh, necessary to keep her under observation. I want her to work in the club. She's a dancer, isn't she? Yes. Well, then your problem's simple. Give her a job dancing. However, the girl was injured. It's impossible for her to dance. Huh? Well, that complicates it a bit. Uh, don't worry about it, big fellow. All you're to do is ask Miss Powers to approach Miss Beekman. Certainly I... not. Now, see here, J.T., I'm not going to ask What Helen... did you say? Well, I certainly don't intend to ask Helen to assist in a matter of this nature. You'll do whatever I tell you to do. I'm not pleased with you, big fella. Stop calling me that. I think you need a lesson, big fella. Stop it. Remember who you are, big fella. Remember, I could walk out and leave this organization around your neck. Isn't that right, big fella? Isn't it? And remember the other things I can do. All right, all right. You've got me by the neck. But you don't Shut have... up, big fella. You glory in it, don't you? What? You'd rather lord it over me than eat. And you love to eat, don't you? Just like a pig, like a big fat hog. Careful, big fella. All right, call me what you want to, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> That's the joke, Humpty Dumpty. I warned you. Go ahead, Humpty Dumpty. You can lord it over me, but you can't stop them from laughing at you. You hate that, don't you, Humpty Dumpty? <laughs> Humpty Dumpty. Shaky. <laughs> Shaky, don't. Please, don't. Stand up. What are you... Stand up, big fella. Don't be afraid. I won't hurt you anymore. <laughs> now walk around your desk. Move, big fella. J.T., I didn't mean it. They don't really laugh at you. You won't. Not anymore. I, I want to apologize. You're going to... My shoe is untied. Uh, the right shoe. Tie my shoe, big fella. J.T. Tie it. Tie it now. Thank you. <laughs> That's very kind, big fella. Ew, not too tight. It's difficult for a fat man to bend over. <laughs> now, go back and sit down. And when you speak to your friend, Miss Powers... I'll tell you exactly what to say. Meanwhile, in the office of Attorney Perry Mason. Yes, Gertie? Well, Mr. Mason's very busy, but I'll ask him. Uh, Chief Francis Raleigh's lawyer wants to speak to you. Oh, all right. Okay, Gertie. Oh, Mr. Francis. Who? Oh, yes. Well, I asked you to give the salesman an appointment well, next I week. I spoke to Francis Riley earlier. You mean a different no. one? Well, he tried very Gertie, hard you sure he's a salesman? Anything, Look, I'll come out and speak to him I myself. I something. Yes. Well, the boy is afraid. No, I have no idea. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm going to check a couple of things. So, uh, suppose we get together in a day or so, Mr. Pratt. I... Perry. Uh, just a moment, Dora. Excuse me just a second, but that salesman isn't a salesman. What? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Pratt, I uh, will have to hang up. There seems to be a slight complication in the office. Hmm. Yes, you phoned me. Now, you said the salesman isn't a salesman. Well, in a way, he is. Here, move your arm, will you? What are you doing? Clearing off your desk. I want the office to look real nice when you see him. Can I see who? The salesman who isn't a salesman? Of course. Well, I'm not going to see Harry, him. Harry, haven't you ever heard of Mr. Donald Thomas Wallace? No. Nope. Well, you're going to, because I'm going to bring him in right now. Well, what do you think? Is the big fellow going to ask Helen Powers? And what do you think Mr. Donald Wallace will mean to Perry Mason? Well, you'll join us tomorrow, won't you? It's mid-afternoon, immediately after the close of our last episode. As in the office of Attorney Perry Mason. Uh, just a moment, Bella. Mr. Wallace is waiting, Perry. Well, that's too bad. I have no time to talk. But you've got to, Perry. Got to, Miss Street? 
Well, I mean, you don't have to, but Mr. Wallace is a very important man, really. Oh, I'm not very important, but I am very busy. So just inform your Mr. Wallace... Harry, Mr. Mr. Wallace is chairman of the board of the National Indemnity Insurance Company. Well, he sounds important. And he's also head of a general insurance alliance. What's that? Well, all the major insurance companies have formed a committee of representatives from each company, General Insurance Alliance. Never heard of it. It was in today's paper. Oh, that's what I get for not reading the paper. Sorry, Dellum. Oh. Uh. You going to make a liar out of me, Chief? What? Well, I told Mr. Wallace you'd see him. Honestly, Perry, most lawyers would be tickled to death if an important man like Mr. Wallace came to see them. Well, the fact remains that I am not tickled to death. Not exciting enough. Oh, I like excitement. I know. I did tell him you'd see him. Well, you shouldn't have without asking. Yes, sir. Now, I trust you didn't make any further commitments. No. I'll give him five minutes. Oh, I knew you would. Oh, come in, Mr. Wallace. This is Mr. Mason. Mr. Mason? Hello, Mr. Wallace. Please sit down. This chair, Mr. Wallace. Thank you. I've uh, come to discuss a very confidential matter, Mr. Mason. Oh, if you're referring to Miss Street, she is my very confidential secretary. Very well. I'll come right to the point. Good. I can only give you a few minutes. Indeed? It'll take longer than a few minutes, Mr. Mason. I'm sorry. I'll have another matter to attend to in just about three and a half minutes. <clears throat> you change your mind. Oh? <clears throat> because what I'm about to tell you is of great importance. And it will prove highly profitable to you. Very profitable. Five figures, so don't worry about the time, Mr. Mason. No, I'm not. I suggest you do. You've only three minutes now. (laughs) I said you'll change your mind, and I'm seldom wrong. Uh, Mr. Wallace... Uh, Use this ashtray, Mr. Wallace. Thank you. All right, Mason, just in case you don't know, I am board chairman over at National Indemnity. Yes, I've heard of it. Naturally, since ours is the largest company in America. I'm also chairman of General Insurance Alliance. Heard of it? A moment ago, from my secretary. Yeah. We thought it best to make a brief announcement to the press, even though our purpose in forming the committee is secret. Then why announce it to the press? Oh, we couldn't keep the committee a secret, Mason. The committee is composed of important men from all major companies. We well, couldn't possibly keep it a secret, but we intend to keep our objective secret. Now, I'm not going to beat around the bush, Mr. Mason. You know how many cars are stolen each month? More to the point, how many claims the insurance companies pay each month? No. I know. Only too well. It's getting to the point where we may be forced to raise our rates. That's why I've come to you. Well, just why have you come to me? I, uh... We want you to represent the Alliance. We want you to destroy what we believe to be a tremendous stolen car ring. I use the word tremendous advisedly. Our preliminary investigation points to an established, very efficient organization. Well, you want a detective, Mr. Wallace, not a lawyer. I beg your pardon, sir. We do want a lawyer to direct the investigation. Only a man with legal and investigative experience could direct it. You're going up against a clever operation, Mason, as you'll see when you study the reports. I'm sorry, Mr. Wallace. What? I've neither the time nor the inclination now, to just come in by... a moment, just a moment, Mason. I, I haven't finished. You'll have unlimited funds for expenses. Naturally, you won't do the investigating yourself. Hire as many men as you like. Work with the police if you want. Now, we believe the ring's headquarters are here in this city. You're here, and you're the logical man to take over. As I say, your fee will run well into five figures. Not 10,000, Mr. Mason. Many times 10,000. Well, what do you say? What I said before, I won't do it. Mr. Mason, this is a tremendously important case. Think of the prestige which will accrue to you. No, Mr. Wallace. Uh, Now, if you'll excuse me, Give me another moment, Mr. Mason. Now, when I tell you... I'm sorry, Mr. Wallace, but I have a phone call to make at 4 o'clock. It is almost 4 now. Uh, Miss Street, would you please show Mr. Wallace out? Yes, sir. Mr. Mason, would you mind very much telling me what's so important you haven't another minute to spare me? I'll grant it's none of my business, but to satisfy my curiosity. Oh, if you really want to know. The daughter of a friend of mine was injured in an auto accident some time back. The girl was a dancer. She's been told that because of her injury, she'll never dance again. It's a bitter disappointment to her. She's studied dancing for years, all she ever wanted to do. Now, I'm going to speak to the doctor to see if there's any chance she'll be able to dance at some later date. Hmm. Well, of course, the young lady's experience is regrettable, but I don't see... Oh, uh, this friend is an important client? Why, no, no, not a client at all. As a matter of fact, he's on parole. Parole? Yes, he's only a friend, Mr. Wallace, but my friends are important to me. Good day, sir. Yes, sir. Good day, Mr. Mason. Well... There goes five figures. Uh, never mind that. 
Want me to phone Dr. Hill? Yes, and uh, while I'm speaking to him, you also phone the Drake Detective Agency, speak to Paul. And? Give him what information we have on Francis Riley. Then ask Paul to learn what he can of his associates and friends. And I would... What's the matter? You kick five figures out the window because a stolen car ring doesn't interest you, but then you turn around to spend money on a boy who did steal a car. Well, there's a big difference, Stella. Yes, I think I know. Frank Riley is a human being. Oh, who needs help? Somebody's got to help him. Well, I'm glad you're somebody who will. Oh, you're not mad at me anymore? Mad? I think you're... Well, I'm going to show you how mad I am. Mm. Why, this is street. <laughs> Wipe the lipstick off your mouth before you speak to Dr. Hill, Counselor, or he'll think you've been in an accident. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside the Consolidated Motor Sales Building... Mr. Herbert G. Selby, president of Consolidated Motor Sales, walks quickly to the office of his vice president. Yes, uh, Mr. Selby. I've got to see you, J.T. Look at this. Keep your voice down, you fool. My secretary is here. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. You shouldn't have come here. It doesn't look well for the president to go to a subordinate's office. I wanted you to see this at once. Then you should have sent for me to come to your office. You're the big fellow, Mr. Selby. I'll remember next time, J.T., but look at this. Not now. J.T. And not here. Come on. Where? Your office. Uh, uh, no, no, we'll go through the outer office. And let me open the door for you. I'll see the inner office telephone is repaired at once, Mr. Selby. At once, sir. I'm dreadfully sorry you had to come for me, sir. Oh, I didn't mind, J.T. You might have sent your secretary to summon me, sir. I rather like to get around the office a bit, J.T. Keep my eye on things, as it were. No, let me open your office door, sir. After you, Mr. Selby. Thank you, J.T. Look at this, J.T. Uh, this story. General Insurance Alliance. Well... It's bad news. This committee is made up of the most important men of the big insurance companies. For the purpose of improving public relations for the insurance companies, it says here. So it says here. Uh, but I lunched at my club today. Oh? What'd you have? Oh, come now, J.T. This is vitally important. Uh, you seem to think so. Uh, what'd you have to eat? Partridge, if you must know. I had lunch with an old gentleman who was a very good friend of my father's. What'd he have? Will you please listen to me? The old gentleman is a past president of an insurance company. And as such, he knows the real purpose of the General Insurance Alliance. Honestly, I could barely finish my lunch when he told me. Barely finish your partner? Oh, really, J.T., I'm giving you tremendously important information. You like to think of me as a mere figurehead. You don't even want to listen. Yeah, I'm listening now. I should think you would. I tell you, J.T., the time will come when you simply have to give me some real authority. Treating me as a schoolboy is simply a waste of my abilities. You got something to say? Say it. Oh yes, yes, of course. The General Insurance Alliance has been formed to combat automobile thefts. Oh. These men are in deadly earnest, J.T. They suspect an auto theft ring of huge proportions. They're willing to spend important money to break it. You see what it can mean, J.T. Yeah, I see what it does mean. Well, let them suspect. Let them spend money. J.T., they banded together. They'll like... probably spend more money collectively than they did separately. Have you seen Helen Powers about Miss Beekman yet? What? No, I I was just on my way, but when I learned this... I... You go see about Miss Beekman. That girl can be really dangerous. Run along and see Miss Powers, big fella. Oh, very well, J.T. Uh, one moment. You never told me, uh, how was the partridge, Herbert? Well, as far as Perry Mason is concerned, apparently J.T. does have no cause to fear the insurance alliance. But J.T. doesn't know what's going to happen in the immediate future. By all means, hear Monday's surprising and dramatic development. In a way, it's quite a distance from the glamorous dance studios of Helen Powers, famous dance director and agent, to the room in Kate Beekman's modest home, where Kate looks through the window at gray skies, chokes back a sob when she thinks of the bleak future ahead. But as we're about to learn, Kate is much closer to Miss Powers than Kate dreams. For at this moment, a tall, well-built, exceedingly handsome gentleman enters Miss Powers' studios, taps on the door of Miss Powers' dressing room... Come in, Suzanne. It's Herbert Selby, Helen, but may I come in anyway? Well, Herbert, of course. How are you, my sweet? How nice of you to drop in. And how are you? You look a bit tired. 
I am. Been working very hard spinning the wheels of commerce. Mm. I intend to let commerce spin its own hoop over the weekend. Going up to the lodge? Mm-hmm. You'll be there this weekend? I'll drive up with Anita and Reggie if the weather's nice. Busy day? Frightful. How I envy you barons of industry. Don't. Oh? Something wrong at consolidated sales? You know how it is, Helen. Business is frightfully complicated. Which brings me to my point. What point? The reason I came to see you. I have a selfish motive, my dear. Do me a favor. Well? Actually, it's a favor for my vice president. Oh, the butterball who walks like a man. <laughs> J.T. came to see me about some young girl, dancer. Beekman. Really, Herbert, are you boys in the automobile business or the entertainment business or the nightclub business? Or... I'm puzzled and confused. And also very pretty. Well, how would you like to dissolve my pretty confusion? In other words, what's this all about? Well, business is complicated. But in a way, it's simple. We've had several good years with the motor company. It leaves me with large cash balances on hand. J.T. is putting the capital to work for me. Various investments. I don't like that fat man, Herbert. I don't like the way he looks, or the way he looks at me. I don't like the way he refers to you as the big fellow. Neither do I. Then why don't you get rid of him? Hmm. What does that mean? It means... You don't understand, Helen. J.T. is useful in spite of his personality. Now, about Miss Beekman... I can't book her, Herbert. The girl was injured in an accident. She'll never dance again. I informed your fat vice president. I know, but still, he wants the girl to work in the club. As I understand it, she can do routine work. If she will. The girl must work. Then why doesn't J.T. offer her a job? Well, he could. But he wants to be certain she'll accept. The girl has a tremendous respect and admiration for you, Helen. As don't we all. Oh, everybody loves me. You want me to talk to her? Will you, Angel? For me. All right. But, Herbert, after this, leave me out, hmm? Business is too complicated for me. And pour me some brandy. You know where it is. Meanwhile, in the office of Perry Mason... What time is it, Della? Uh, Almost six. Mm, big day. Mm. Let's call it a day. I'm afraid we can't, Chief. Mr. Wallace is in the outer office. What? Mr. Wallace, board chairman at National Indemnity Insurance Company. The man who wanted you to investigate... I know who Donald Wallace is, Donald. Well, now you know. He's sitting out there in the office, and he's not alone. There's a woman with him. Uh, you know her? No, she's a middle-aged woman, rather nice-looking, nicely dressed. Why does this Now, why that? complain? Because one of the most important businessmen in the Bella, country... Bella, I turned him down. And now? And now I'll have to turn him down again. Well, he said he'd make you change your mind. Yes, he said. Good afternoon, Mr. Mason. Good afternoon, Mr. Wallace. I'm just leaving the office. Not before I say I was wrong, and I know it. I didn't know enough about you when I spoke to you earlier, which was an error. Maybe you didn't know enough about me. How do you mean? Give me 60 seconds, then I get out or we talk turkey. All right, shoot. All right. I'm a salesman, but I did a bad job of selling you. I didn't know enough about my prospect. So when I walked out of this office this afternoon, I went to work. I know a lot more about you, Mason. I know you've got to be interested before you'll take a case. I came in and offered you big money to investigate a big stolen car ring. It's more than a ring. It's an industry. You weren't interested. No. You will be. When you know what this is all about... Mr. Wallace... Not in terms of dollars and cents, Mr. Mason. Let me go ahead. All right. Then I'll shut up and let you listen to this lady, uh, Mrs. Smith. Her name isn't Smith, Mr. Mason. When you change your mind, and I think you will, you'll know her name. But for the present... How do you do, Mrs. Smith? Very well, sir. My secretary, Miss Street. Hello, Mrs. Smith. My dear. Mason, you're interested in a young boy named Francis Riley. Riley's in jail waiting trial on a charge of auto theft. Hmm. Well, you have been busy. We're also interested in Riley. We've reason to believe he was associated with the stolen car ring. It's possible. The boy hasn't talked. We know. We think he was warned not to talk. You know that? No, but it's also possible. He is frightened. Yeah. I told you this stolen car racket's big. All right. Forget how big in dollars and cents. Think how big in... In terms of human beings, boys and girls like Frank Riley. 
We believe that racket recruits boys and girls to steal the cars. What? Yes. Recruits them. Corrupts them. And they're careful, Mason. Careful to protect the higher-ups. But we've got a lead. And we can bust them. Smash them. If we can get the right man to do the job. What is the lead? Mrs. What? Mrs. Smith will tell you. Yes, Mrs. Smith? I... I have a daughter, Mr. Mason. She's 20. I love my daughter very much, Mr. Mason. I haven't been a good mother, but I love her very much. Donna's a pretty girl. I have her picture. May I show you her picture? Yes, yes, of course. Oh, she is pretty. Thank you. I haven't seen my daughter for six months. Oh, it isn't easy for me to tell you this, but I must... I... Are you all right, Mrs. Smith? I... Yes, yes, I'm all right. There was no reason for Donna to run away. At least I didn't know the reason. Our family's fortunate. She's always had everything. Perhaps, perhaps she'd had too much. Perhaps I had too much. I was too busy to see what was happening to my daughter. She... Is your daughter mixed in this? Uh, uh, Mr. Wallace is very... He's a close family friend. I didn't suspect anything until Donna ran away. Then we turned to Mr. Wallace. Had detectives working for months, naturally. Mm Mm-hmm. And? I heard my daughter speak once on the phone. I heard only a name when I told Mr. Wallace. I had heard the name before. Is it connected up with the uh, stolen car racket? Yes. Just a single name. Common, maybe coincidence. But when you put this and that together, it doesn't look like coincidence. And it doesn't look pretty. If we're right... And Lord knows I wish we were wrong. What happened to this girl and to Frank Riley has happened to hundreds. I said hundreds of young people. They are what this thing is all about, Mr. Mason. Now, don't misunderstand me. The dollars and cents are important, too, and I'm no sentimentalist. A lot of those kids were going bad anyway, and nothing could keep them from going bad. But a lot of those kids were decent, which means we're up against an evil, corrupt, ruthless organization, Mr. Mason. You, uh... Going to help us bust it? I don't know. Mr. Mason, it may be too late to help my daughter. For all I know, she may not even be alive. Steady, my dear. I was going to say, I wouldn't think of undertaking this unless I could give it sufficient time. We only want you to organize it, Mr. Mason. We don't expect... Well, I have other obligations, Mr. Wallace. And it wouldn't be fair to any of us... All right. I don't ask your decision now. All I ask is you don't decide now. Think about it. Will you do that? All right, I'll think about it. But I'm not promising. I understand. But I think you'll take the case, Mr. Mason. And I'm seldom wrong. But come, my dear. Oh, uh, suppose I phone you on Monday, Mr. Mason. Well, on the surface, it is a long way from Kate Bakeman to Herbert Selby. From Consolidated Motor Sales Corporation to the job, insurance president Donald Wallace is offered Perry Mason. But beneath the surface... Well, there'll be excitement and surprising developments in the immediate future. So join us tomorrow, won't you? It's nine in the morning as... Officer Perry Mason. No, sir, Mr. Mason hasn't come in yet. Oh, just a moment, sir. Odella. Good morning, Gertie. Do you know when Mr. Mason will be here? Any minute, I hope. Mr. Mason's expected momentarily, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Donald Thomas Wallace will be in his office all day and wants Mr. Mason to phone him at his earliest convenience. Okay. Hey, Mr. Wallace. He's head of that big insurance company. He came in yesterday. Yes, after you left. Hey, Della, be sure my coat's out of the way when you hang us up. What? Please be careful of my coat. Don't mash it. Well, I wouldn't think of mashing your coat, Gertie. Why? Didn't you see? I got flowers. This time of the year. <laughs> Harry brought me a corsage. I pinned him on my coat this morning. <laughs> Big night? Uh-huh. Harry and I went dancing. Oh, good. Good morning, ladies. Oh, hi, oh, Good morning, Mr. Mason. Mail's already in your office, Chief. Right. Uh, Gertie, did Mr. Wallace say he'd be in all day? Uh-huh. Shall I get him for Mr. Mason now? No, not yet. I'll tell you when. And if. Oh, Della, we got the offer from Buckley. You can draw up the agreement I drafted. All right. Oh, Chief, look. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Wallace phoned. Mr. Donald Thomas Wallace. Yes, he said he'd phone this morning. Now, about that agreement Excuse with Buckley. Excuse me, Perry, but Mr. Wallace wants you to phone him. 
Said he'd be in his office all day. Well, then it's all right as long as I phone sometime today. Hmm? Now, are you going to keep me on pins and needles all day, Mr. Mason? You? What do you mean, Noah? You know very well what I mean. Are you going to direct the investigation for that group of insurance companies, or aren't you? I refer to the investigation of the stolen car ring, in case you've forgotten. I remember. But you haven't told me. I don't know, Della. You mean you can't make up your mind? Hmm? No. I'm not sure I'm the right man to handle the job. Oh, Perry. Well, the insurance people think you are. Some of the smartest businessmen in the country... I have thought about it, Della, a great deal. I'm a lawyer, not an expert on auto theft. Yes, but, Chief, you uh, do... I have to know more about that used car racket before I can decide. Get Lieutenant Tragg for me, please. Oh, uh, Gertie, get Lieutenant Tragg at Homicide, please. Wasn't Tragg an auto theft at one time? Tragg? No, oh, not that I know of, but I need some more information. Maybe he can tell me who to contact. Hello. Oh, yes, Gertie. Okay, put him right on. Here he is, Chief. Thank you. Hello, Trag. It's Perry Mason. Swell. Say, Trag, I want some information on stolen cars. I... Yes, I remember you're on homicide. I also remember that you're a police officer and... As such, you have friends who are police officers. Perhaps even a friend in auto theft? A gent who can and will give me information when you clear the way for me? Hmm. Thank you. Who? Oh, write this down, Ella. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Ed Bailey, auto theft. Well, today, if possible. That's right. Hmm? Well, now, why should I tell you what it's all about? You're in homicide. What do you care about auto theft? <laughs> all right, I'll see you, Dragon. Thanks. Ah, now, do you think we can turn out that agreement? Is... Oh. Excuse me. Yes, Gertie. Oh, great. Well, wait a minute. Harry, that girl the secretarial service sent us, she's not coming in. Hmm? She ran away and got married over the weekend. I'm very happy for her. Me too. But what am I going to do about getting somebody else? Don't. If I do take the insurance case, we'll be working in secret. I want no strangers in the office. Oh, okay. Uh, don't phone the secretarial service yet, Gertie. Perry, oh. since Kate Beekman can't dance anymore, maybe now she'd take a job here. We know Kate. We can trust her. No, Della. Oh, Perry, I trust Kate Beekman to the end Please, of the... Please, Miss Street, of course I trust her. You forget the insurance case? Yes, but that's exactly what I'm thinking of. Oh... Dangerous, maybe. Hmm? Well, you never know, possibly. You never know where this kind of investigation will take you, which is all right for us. We're used to it, and we'll go into it with our eyes open. Hmm. But we can't ask Kate to share our danger, not even to give her a job. I guess you're right. Well, she'll get a job. Yes, but when? What's that mean? Oh, you speak to Kate's mother? Yes, I did. I don't blame a girl, Perry. If I were hurt as bad as she has been, maybe I'd close myself in my room, too. Well, maybe you would, but... Uh... You'd have to come out sometime. So will Kate, when she's ready. Meanwhile, we are out, so, Della, let's go to work. And in the Beekman home. Kate? Kate, are you asleep? What is it, Ma? I want to come in a minute. Oh, please, Ma, I, I brought you something. Yes, Ma. It's hot chocolate. Now, you'll be sure and drink it, Katie. I'll try. You've got to eat or you won't have the strength to get out of bed. I'll get up as soon as I feel like it, Ma. You want me to get up when I don't feel like it? Not if you're sick. Not if you're hurt. And not if it'd be bad for you to get up. But you're not sick. Doctor says it won't hurt you to be up and around. He says you ought to be. For what? What did you say? I said... Oh, don't pay any attention to me, Ma. I won't. And I advise you to forget you said it. Now, Katie, just because you've had to stop dancing doesn't mean you have to stop living. Now, get some light in here. And you drink that hot chocolate cake. I, I really don't want it. All right, Ma, I'll, I'll try. And, Kate, if you can make yourself get up, go for a walk. I'll go along if you want me to, or, or you go by yourself, whichever you like. Only, Kate... Don't turn away from the world. My. I. Oh, my. Oh, baby. 
Don't you think <coughs> I understand? Don't you know the easiest thing for me would be to just just leave you alone? Leave you alone and let you stay in here? Honey. Now, I don't want it to seem hard and ununderstanding after what's happened. But Katie, the longer you shut yourself away, the harder it'll be to see people again. You're right, Ma. I know you are. And I'll try it, but... Pa said you told him you were going to look for a job. Oh, I, I am. I've got to work. It's the best way to get your mind off yourself. But you can't do it lying here, so... Ma... Did you speak to Mr. Mason? Why, why, yes. Did he say anything about... about the job in the office? Well, no, he didn't. Oh. You expect him to... Well, I... I didn't expect him to exactly, but I... I... You turned it down when he offered it before, honey. Oh, Ma, I didn't expect him to offer me a job again. I... I just thought he might. It would be easier to work for somebody I know. Maybe... You want to get it? All right, I will. Hello? This is Mrs. Beekman. Wait. Wait, yes, but she's in bed. Who's calling, please? Oh, yes. Why, yes. Goodbye. Hmm. Who was it, Ma? Was it Mr. Mason? No. It was Miss Helen Powers. Miss Powers? Yeah. She wants to come and see you. Why? She didn't say. She's coming late this afternoon, and, well, if it's all right with you... Katie, you want to see her? Uh, I don't know. Didn't she give you any idea? I don't know why a dance director would want to see me. I can't dance anymore. Well, you don't have to see her. Oh, chocolate's cold now. I'll heat it for you. Uh, it's all right. I wonder what Miss Powers could want. You're going to talk to her? Yes. I just wonder what she wants of me. Well, as you heard, Perry Mason doesn't dare offer Kate a job because it could mean possible danger to her. But as Perry Mason can't possibly know, Helen Powers' visit to Kate Beekman can well mean not possible danger, but definite peril. You'll join us tomorrow, won't you? Early afternoon at police headquarters in the office of Lieutenant Bailey. Out of theft division, Bailey speaking. No, bring him straight up to my office. I'm going to have a distinguished visitor and he'll be interested, so shoot the kid straight up here. Now, my distinguished visitor is here now. We'll be waiting. Lieutenant Bailey. That's right, and you're... My name is Perry Mason. It's my secretary, Miss Street. Oh, you didn't have to tell me your name, Mr. Mason. You're a famous man. And Lieutenant Tragg told me you were coming in. Sit down. Thank you. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Out of theft, Bailey. Okay, maybe we'll come in and take a look. In case Mr. Mason's interested. Sorry I can't give you my complete attention, Mr. Mason, but I'm on duty. It's quite all right, Lieutenant. I'm not here on official business, so if you're too busy to see me, I... <laughs> That's a hot one, Mr. Mason. What do you mean? Maybe you aren't here officially. I'm not. Care to tell me just why you are here? Well, I'm not at liberty to give you the details. I asked to speak to someone in a responsible position, auto theft. Craig told me that you were the man. Mm, so you could drop in and uh, straighten this out, hmm? What? Lieutenant, I came here to get general information in reference to the routine and the procedures of your division. For a highly confidential reason. That's right. Well, come along, Delavie. Lieutenant is busy. Oh, now, now just, just a moment. You came for information. All right, I'll give you some. Yes? Last week, the heads of the biggest insurance companies formed a committee and called it the General Insurance Alliance. Each company kicked in a wad of dough and they got a great big kitty. They also named the board chairman of the biggest company as head of the committee. And they told him to go out and hire a guy to bust up an auto theft ring. 
All this is highly confidential, you understand. Why tell me, since it's confidential? Because you're the gent they want to bust the rackets. Well, if that's true, how do you know? Well, I'm just a dumb cop, Miss Street. But I can add two and two. I've got sources of information. Not that I'm smart, you understand. But I'm smart enough to add two and two and get four... I'm also smart enough to know you can add oil to water, but they don't mix. Meaning you won't cooperate? Meaning we can't. Because, frankly, Mr. Mason, I don't see what you've got to offer. Thanks. All right, Della. Oh, uh, you have more information? Uh, that's all. If you've made up your mind to take on the job, if you have, oh, we'll be interested in your progress, Mr. Mason. And... Since we don't want to get the insurance companies down on us, we'll uh, cooperate in any way. Lieutenant, according to my information, those companies are taking a beating. Now, of course, you're doing the best that you can. Well, just one more thing before you decide you can do any better, Mr. Mason. Those companies are taking a beating because we're up against a new racket. Now, here's how it works. It's simple. But it's tough to break. There's millions of cars in a hundred-mile radius of this city. And when one of them's stolen, it don't break out in black and white stripes. It looks just the same. It looks just like thousands of other cars that aren't stolen. Well, license plates. Mm-hmm, yes. But the racket boys work fast. Switch the plates before they drive it away. I mean fast. They got a special clamp for the new plate. Then they drive it away in traffic, take it to a garage and paint it, stamp on a new motor serial number, fix up a fake bill of sale and sell it. But not here. Maybe they sell it a thousand miles away. And say we trace one. Who do we go up against? The guy who buys it? Well, he just bought a car. The guy who sold it? <laughs> By that time, he's a thousand miles away. Start at the other end. You're right, Mr. Mason. We got right to the heart of the matter. Our best bet's to start with the guys who steal and distribute the cars. Uh, we've kind of been working on that. Oh, I'm sure you have. Mr. Mason... How'd you like it if you took a licking in court every day? I wouldn't. Well, we're taking a beating every day, and not just us. There's the kids those racket guys hired to steal the cars for them. Sure, we started at this end. We've caught some of the drivers. And? And nothing. Nothing so far. Well, sooner or later we'll get a break. Sooner or later one of those kids is going to talk. Won't they talk? Why? I just wondered. Yeah, yeah they'll talk. Well, but you Excuse just... Excuse me, Dillon. Uh, then what is your difficulty, Lieutenant? <laughs> Looks simple to you, huh? All right, I think I've got one of the racket drivers on his way up here now. You want to stick around while I question him? Why, yes. Swell. You're about to learn something, Mr. Mason. Excuse me while I check that last job. Perry, Francis Riley worked for this racket, and he won't talk. Yes, well, we know that, Bella. But that's information we'll keep to ourselves for a while. And then perhaps, um, well, I'm just a dumb, inexperienced lawyer, you understand. Oh, sure. But perhaps I can teach the lieutenant something, too. Meanwhile, miles away from the city, Gordy Weber leaves the nightclub he's going to manage for J.T. and the big fellow. And now, as he sees a powerful car pull off the heavily traveled highway, waves and... You want me to park it for you, J.T.? No. Hop in. Oh, but J.T., the painters are at work in a clock. Hop in, Gordy. I've got something to show you. Something I'm certain will please you. Well, you're the boss, of course, if you say so. I say so. I'll have you back shortly. Uh-huh. And, uh, Gordy, you're going to like this. Uh, I'm pleased at the manner in which you followed my instructions. Huh? In the parking lot. It's laid out just as desired. Oh, oh well, J.T., I learned my lesson. I'm doing what I'm told. <laughs> Let the big fella know, huh? I certainly will. I certainly will. Yeah. Are we turning off the highway already? Uh-huh. Into there? That old warehouse? Uh, not a warehouse, Gordy. A new storage garage. Oh. It'd be convenient, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, and risky, so close to the club. Yeah, <laughs> that's all been considered. <laughs> well, let's go in. The door opens automatically. Yeah, 
And now we're on the main floor of the garage. And watch this. Uh, you gonna run into that wall, J.P.? Uh, watch the wall, Gordy. Uh, uh, watch it. Hey, the whole wall slides away when you tap the horn just right, huh? Uh-huh. Now we're in the elevator. You see how it works? Yeah. One of Gus's boys picks up a car and drives it out here. That highway's been checked and it carries a heavy traffic until after midnight. The boy delivers it to Gus at the club. Gus drives it here. Slips into this elevator. It goes upstairs where Albert and his crew change the paint job, number, and motor, and tires if necessary. Mm -hmm. There's an emergency passage being built between the club and the garage, but... That's only to be used by you or Gus or in case of emergency. Yeah, yeah, I get it, J.T. In other words, we're ready to start operating, huh? Almost. What do you mean, almost? The nightclub's about ready, this garage is about ready. But everything else isn't. There are loopholes to be plugged. Loop? Oh. Oh, you mean Kate Beekman? Among others... Uh, what you told Kate hits too close to home. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll never, I'll never run off at the mouth again, J.T. I'm sure you won't. Well, we'll take care of her. We have to. As I said, that boner of yours strikes too close to home. The insurance companies are starting to fight back. Well, haven't they always? Not like this. Another of Gus's boys was picked up yesterday. Well, so what? What can he tell the cops? Nothing, I hope. At least I hope he doesn't know any more than Francis Riley. Oh, J.T., Riley clammed up, didn't he? So far. If he clammed up so far, he'll stay clammed. He's scared. Uh, which brings me to the main point. Perry Mason's interested. So? I'm beginning to think the big fellow was wrong when he said Gordy's impatient, but he has brains. No, no, I get it all right, J.T. It's just, uh... Well, you know, Mason's, uh... Mason's not ten feet tall. He might be, if the insurance companies asked him to represent them. Well, yeah, well, anyway, can I start the club? As soon as we're positive of Miss Beekman, uh, we'll know about her shortly. Yeah? The big fellow is taking care of that personally uh, through a friend of his. Yeah, well, now you've seen the setup, I'll take you back to the club and you can watch the carpenters. Well, as you can see... If Kate Beekman accepts the job offered by dance director Helen Powers, Kate will be surrounded by all the men Perry Mason will be fighting if he accepts the offer made by Donald Wallace, insurance company salesman. You can see there's going to be plenty of excitement. So won't you join us for it? Early afternoon, immediately after the close of our last episode as Kate Beekman eagerly, curiously, awaits a visit from Helen Powers. Meanwhile, in the auto theft division of police headquarters, in the office of Lieutenant Edward Bailey... O'Brien, this is Lieutenant Bailey. Send in a police stenographer, will you? I want to take a statement from a prisoner. Well, why not? And just how long will I have to wait? I have a very distinguished uh, visitor. Excuse me, Lieutenant. Just a minute, mystery. I can take shorthand. You? Is that okay with you, Mr. Mason? That's up to you and Miss Street. Oh, I don't mind if it'll save time. Hey, never mind, O'Brien. I've got a stenographer. Compliments of the distinguished visitor. They're going to bring the kid in now. Now, let's get a couple of things straight before they do, Lieutenant. Such as? First, Miss Street is acting as stenographer. Compliments of Miss Street, not me. Well, then I'll say thanks to Miss Street. What else, Mr. Mason? If you resent my presence here, I'll get out. No, sir. No, no, no. I want you to stick around so you won't get in my way later. We can and will do the job, and we don't need some fancy Dan looking over our shoulder. And nothing personal intended, Mr. Mason. I hope you don't clear out now. Not yet. Because when you see what we're up against, you'll want to clear out. For good. There he is now. Harry. Uh, just call me fancy Dan. Okay, son, drive on in. Go sit in that straight chair beside my desk. Okay, Lute. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Bailey. I know your name, Lute. Oh, we got company, huh? This is Marion C. Cahill. He's called Snooky. This is Mr. Mason and Miss Street. Hiya, Miss Street. I'll tell you what. You call me Snooky, and I'll call Mind you... Mind your manners, kid. Miss Street's going to take notes on what we say. What you say, Lute. I ain't talking. Not before I see my lawyer. Yeah? Who's your lawyer, Cahill? I haven't decided. You know a good lawyer, miss? I'll see you get to a lawyer. Swell. When? After we have our little talk. Uh-uh. I ain't talking, Lieutenant. Don't be a chump, kid. We caught you driving a stolen car. Okay if I smoke, Lieutenant. 
You're only making it tough on yourself. I want a lawyer. Mr. Mason here is a lawyer. He'll tell you there's nothing a lawyer can do to get you out of this. You, Perry Mason? Yes. Ask him, Cahill. Why should I ask him? He's on your side. He'll give you the word of a lawyer. Why should I believe anybody on your side? Uh, Cahill, it's true. I, uh, hope to work with the police. Well, I don't mind telling you your legal rights. You have the right to consult an attorney of your choice. Mason. And the lieutenant cannot force you to make a statement against your will. That's just what I'm talking about, Mason. Look at this boy, Lieutenant. He doesn't feel one half as tough as he talks. But he's, uh, not a fool. All right, Mason, you've said enough. I said he's not a fool. Do you have a record, Cahill? Why? I can tell you, yeah. He's got a record. I've got it right here. Uh, <clears throat> Cahill, Marion C., Snooky, age 20. Placed on probation as juvenile delinquent 7347, apprehended and charged with vandalism, 72148. Committed to Boys Correctional Institute, 8148, released 8149. Arrested for loitering in vicinity of felony, car theft, charge dismissed. Lack of evidence. Arrested for car theft, 21050, tried, convicted, released 51552. Various appearances at the show up and held for questioning three times. Yeah, he's got a record. Well, then you know the ropes, son. Clamming up won't get you anywhere. And where will talking get me? What about that, Mr. Mason? You, uh, you offering me a deal? Now, you know better than that. Nobody's going to promise you a thing. But I can tell you this, uh... With Lieutenant Bailey's permission. Go ahead. We want the men who operate, the syndicate, the heads, your boss. I'm sure the lieutenant and the district attorney will regard as a favor anything you can do for them. And if you're really smart, you'll do the people on our side all the favors you can. You are in trouble. Yeah. Only, I, I, I can't tell you what I don't know. You don't know who you work for? No. Well, how could you... Oh, well, you take over, Lieutenant. No, oh, I'd rather watch you, Mr. Mason. Go right ahead. Start telling the truth, Cahill. I am. I don't know the guy I worked for. Weren't you to be paid for the car you stole? Sure. Well, who was going to pay you? I don't know. You don't have to dig it out of me, Mr. Mason. I'll tell you, I... I know when I'm licked. I... I work for a smart guy, Mr. Mason. I guess there's smart guys back of him. You call it a syndicate. I, I don't know. Maybe it is. Anyhow, the guy I worked for was smart. When I got out of reform school, I went back to live with my folks. My old man was working, and it wasn't so bad. Then I... I don't know. I got a couple of jobs, but... I, I don't know. The jobs was no good. Anyhow, I was broke all the time, you know? So, one night, this guy speaks to me. It was dark, so I, I couldn't see him. So I stepped out of an alley, like. Anyhow, he says uh, he knows me, and uh, do I want a job? I says, maybe. Doing what? And he gives me 50 bucks to pick up a car. Paid me in advance said if I did what he said, why, I'd make a lot more dough on other jobs. You do it? Yeah, I picked it up. Deliver it to him? Oh, no. I never saw the guy again. Not that I saw much the one time I did see him. What did you do with the car? Delivered it to a side street number he gave me. I heard from him a couple of days later, this time on the phone. He says, uh, you know who this is? And I said, sure. And he gave me another order. Operate the same way? Mm, just about different cars, different places to drop them. Mm-hmm. And you were always contacted by phone? Yeah. Yeah, the guy would call two, three, maybe four, five times a week. He'd always have the heap spotted. I mean, he'd say to go to such and such an address at such and such a time, and you'll see a car park. Deliver it to a certain address. License plates? Uh, they sent me some through the mail. They pay you by mail? Yeah. Get the picture, Mr. Mason? Well, I'm getting it. I think it's clear enough. The guy Cahill worked for is a nice, neat racket. He contacts some kid by phone. If the kid's caught, what can he tell us? Describe a voice over the phone? There's a little more than that. Oh, sure. Cahill? Yeah? What type cars did you usually pick up? Oh, once in a while, an expensive custom job, but mostly medium-priced stuff. Chevys, Dodges, Fords, you know, Hudson, Studebakers. Yeah, 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 stuff that's hard to spot. Late model, medium-priced cars they could sell for around $1,500. Say they only netted 1000 bucks a car. They sell 1000 cars, they make a million bucks. Which doesn't explain where they got their drivers. Cahill just told us. He told us how he started working for them. But not many kids would accept the proposition without more contact with the boss than Cahill had. How about that, Cahill? Uh, I could have maybe an idea, Mr. Mason. Uh -huh. Kid, you got something to say, say it straight. If you don't mind, Lieutenant, I'm interested in Cahill's kind of an idea. Yeah? Okay, what's your idea, Cahill? I'm not saying it's this way, Lieutenant. Uh, you hear me, Mr. Mason? I hear you. 
Well, uh, uh, say I've been working for the guy who calls me up for um, uh, maybe a year. And he calls me and asks me if I know anybody. You know, uh, anybody wants to work for him like I do. So uh, maybe I say, uh, maybe I do. Cut out the maybes, Cahill. I'll tell it my way or I don't tell it, Lieutenant. Let's listen, Bailey. Hey. Uh, I'm not saying this did happen, but uh, it could have. I, I could have contacted some guys I know and uh, feel them out. And if any of them are really interested, I pass their name along to the guy who calls me on the phone. Well, you got any more questions, Mr. Mason? No. Come on, Cahill. O'Brien, take Cahill downstairs and book him. Well, there's your answer, Mason. But it don't bring us any closer to the higher-ups. That's a clever scheme. I knew you'd think so. You see what we're up against? Yes, you certainly have got your problem. Yeah. But we'll bust it. We'll get a break. We'll bust it. And we don't need a mastermind second-guessing us. You got any brilliant suggestions? Well, nothing brilliant, perhaps. I, uh... Oh, I suggest you let Miss Street transcribe her notes so you can study them carefully. I'll send them right over, Lieutenant. Well, anything else, Mr. Mason? Well, uh, not just at the moment, Lieutenant. You're smart enough to see you've got no place in this fight. Oh, uh, you're a good man in your element, Mason. They say you do real well in a courtroom. But now you're out of your debt. What about the Cesar case and the Bot case? This what... isn't stolen jewels, Miss Street. This is a tough, dirty fight. Well, we keep slugging till we bat their ears down. I prefer fighting with my brain, personally. Ah. Well, you see, you want no part of this, huh? Well, I, um... Uh, you've certainly given me something to think about, Lieutenant. But, Perry... The Lieutenant has made some very pertinent points, Della. In regard to the fight against the stolen car syndicate? Well, Mr. Mason's not backing away from a fight, Miss Street. I know him better than that. Mr. Mason's thinking how those insurance men would feel if he took their dough and didn't deliver it is something to think about. Well, thanks ever so much, Lieutenant. Uh, come, Bella. Good day, Lieutenant Bailey. Good day, Mr. Mason. Harry, he thinks you're afraid to take the job. Mm, seems to. Well, but I... Now, wait a minute. You said to call you Fancy Dan. Are you being fancy, Counselor? Oh. You're up to something, Perry Mason. Maybe. What? Maybe I'll tell you. Later. All right, Della. Here's the elevator. It's obvious Perry Mason has something up his sleeve. It's equally obvious Della doesn't know what it is. What do you think it is? Well, you'll join us tomorrow, won't you?